Hey guys, it's Mrs. Wallace. I hope you guys are doing A-OK. -okay. Um, I know it's been a couple of days and um, things have gotten a little crazy. So uh, hang in there. We're going to make the best of this and uh, do what we do, which is, you know, learning a little bit about world history. And if you ever have questions or comments about some of the things that are going on in uh, current events, you know, certainly put that um, on the discussion board. Um, but we're going to try to focus a lot on um, using this half hour time uh, to do a little bit with uh, the topic. So I'll introduce a little bit of information. You'll also get a chance to read a little bit and to put some comments. So a half an hour goes by really uh, quickly. So just know I'm kind of thinking about you and uh, you know we're all again just going to do the best we can with kind of this very crazy situation. Uh, so last time we met we were looking at um, the uh, topic of the Renaissance and we are going to look at this movement to humanism. We've already done it uh, for the most part in art so we've looked at how um, Renaissance art is maybe a little bit different from humanist art. A lot of that has to do with the content of the art becoming more like human in form, maybe in some cases a little bit more secular or at least the depiction of divine figures look a little more human. We also saw the nature of like art becoming much more uh, realistic, especially uh, regarding the way perspective was employed by a whole bunch of artists. Um, but we also can see the movement to humanism uh, in the way in which education dramatically changes between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So if we kind of note a few things about education in the Middle Ages, um, just by kind of looking at the slide that you have in front of you, note that there is a note sheet that you can use. You can print it out and handwrite in it. Um, you can always go back to the PowerPoint, do that later. You can also, um, since you have the PowerPoint and the video, you can decide, you know, you're not going to write down those notes and just use the PowerPoint. Sometimes I like to write notes because it helps me add some information um, and that can be useful. So um, you might want to do that uh, later on in the day. But a couple of things about um, education in the Middle Ages. And, you know, the Middle Ages is a very long time period in Europe, so it's not necessarily always the same regarding education. We looked back at early Middle Ages, um, for example, in the time of Charlemagne and like the 800s, we know that there's some emphasis on education and Charlemagne tries to improve literacy in uh, creating some schools. And we also know throughout the Middle Ages, um, there becomes a huge focus on uh, the role of monks in monasteries, inscribing texts and becoming essentially, you know, the educated class. So they're uh, remote from society. Monasteries tended to be, you know, tucked away in the hills. People had to make, you know, special uh, movements to try to get into a monastery. Uh, many people uh, who were monks are really, you know, isolated from society. So education and religion become very, very tied together. And we don't really see education under the monasteries becoming necessarily academic. There's a great deal of preservation of classical and religious texts. And in some cases, um, some study of those texts but much less commentaries on those texts. Uh, you can compare that a little bit with what was happening in the Islamic empire. There's a great deal of commentary and rigor going on in discussions related to the text. So um, there's a very different approach uh, in the earlier part of the Middle Ages. As time goes on in the 1200s, there's a movement away from that monastery model. So you get um, universities, right, that are actually going to be in places like England or Italy uh, France, you know, Paris, France. A lot of these universities are in some cases sponsored by new churches. There's brand new churches, uh, these Gothic churches that are starting to be built in the late Middle Ages. They're massive and right next to them uh, is often a university. And so wealthy merchants and the church are kind of together in creating this model of the university. Sometimes students are actually pushing for a university and they put money together to hire a uh, teacher. Sometimes it's the teacher who is seeking the student. So there's not like one recipe for how these universities develop, but they do become rather specialized. Um, there are uh, medical schools, for example, in Salerno is one of them. Uh, some of them are specific to law. Some of them are specific to uh, theology. So um, in uh, the area of Paris, 
there is a very large, you know, think of like Notre Dame, um, there being a school kind of next to that particular uh, church building, and there is a um, theology uh, school there. Most of the people who went to universities, in some cases, were young. They could be young as 13 or 14 years old. They tended to be male, and they tended to come from wealthy families. They were also considered part of the lower clergy. So once people went to university, even if they were in a school that was like a medical school, School, they were um, actually part of the clergy. So they were treated in courts as like different from the rest of society. So kind of like this new scholar male uh, starts to develop. And, you know, in some cases, we see other models for education, some schools, um, tutoring, you know, maybe monasteries are still supporting education. Some girls might be getting education at home if they came from a wealthy family. So there's some of those models. This just gives you a sense of where some of these uh, universities might be because of course you know it's interesting to us quite a few of them still exist so this is the city of Florence which will be one of the places that we'll look at and of course you know we're all seeing maps of Italy all the time now you know because of the coronavirus uh, Padua another uh, place where there's a huge um, university uh, also um, in Paris um, in uh, you know Cambridge and Oxford those are still a uh, university names you know familiar to us Wittenberg over in Germany Salamanca in Spain, these are all, um, you know, kind of in the 1500s or so, these would be popular universities. Some of them uh, developed as early as the 1200s. This gives you an idea of kind of this Middle Ages, you know, model. These universities were largely classrooms where individuals had access to a teacher who was reading the text directly to the students and engaging in a lot of questioning and answering. And um, the Middle Ages model is wrapped around this one specific type of teaching and learning. And and we'll just spend a little bit of time on this, but it's called uh, scholasticism. Scholasticism is where we get the name, you know, scholar or school from. So, you know, it's really all about the scholars, the people who are teaching and the students who are learning. There's a great deal of effort to kind of enable a whole bunch of different authorities of knowledge develop uh, for students. And scholasticism is one method of using certain questioning and certain uses of text in an effort to get people to understand kind of uh, knowledge and understand uh, maybe key questions. So there's a couple key things about scholasticism. First of all, its emphasis is on knowing and reaching truth, okay? Scholasticism is not about creating new knowledge. This isn't invention and science just for science sake or discovering or anything like that. It is about collecting text, every bit of text that might exist on a particular topic. So we see these books in the Middle Ages known as the Summas, Summa Theologica. These are books like everything that there is to know about theology at the time gets kind of piled into a book and scholastics love to compile texts and then questions really big questions become raised and what the scholastics do is kind of piece up the variety of texts so that they are um, used on both sides of the question it kind of sounds a little bit like an historical investigation but one scholar might propose all of the authorities for one argument related to that question and then somebody has to find the opposing arguments for that question and then you look at both of them together so it's like a little bit of like a dialectic these kind of things that are going back and forth in opposition and what's interesting to a lot of scholastics is how to take some religious texts which are largely Christian texts that are biblical and connect them with classical texts which sometimes are preceding Christianity and to try to rectify these things together. Um, so scholastics are often looking to harmonize conflicts in text and um, use the language of the text itself and logic to actually figure out what is different in each of the texts. Okay, it's like a very cerebral, you know, mind-blowing thing to sit down and kind of prepare um, scholastic um, arguments or to read through some of these uh, things. A lot of the emphasis is on deductive reasoning um, based on Aristotle. Um, Aristotle, who's a classical thinker, right, from the 300s is, you know, the 300s, the 400 BC, you know, is really um, focused on using logic. He loved syllogism. So an example of a syllogism is kind of like, 
you know, if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. So arguments that kind of have that type of focus. Um, so like, you know, um, all uh, men are animals. You know, Mrs. Wallace is a human or a man, right? So therefore, I am an, an animal, okay? That type of logic is the types of arguments that were done oftentimes in the um, uh, scholastic uh, framework, okay? So if you take a moment and look at one of the um, examples that you have as a source, okay? So we're gonna actually like ask you to turn off the video and then um, come back to the next clip. You're gonna be reading an excerpt from Thomas Aquinas, okay? Who writes in the 1200s, he's quite famous. He was influenced very heavily by the Islamic scholars, in particular Avicenna or Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina and Thomas Aquinas think very, very much alike. Both are heavily influenced by Aristotle. And what Thomas Aquinas sets out to do in a work known as Summa Theologica is try to find ways to put uh, the kind of notion of um, God and Christianity kind of on one side and to put some of the uh, Aristotelian ways of arguing on the other and he tries to use a little bit of um, reason to some extent to try to um, argue that um, we can know that there is actually um, a God <laughs> or that God exists. So one of the ways he tries to do this is um, the arguments of the five ways. You're looking at the first of the five ways. If you take a second and um, eyeball that, okay, and then just turn off the video, bloop, <laughs> see you in a few, turn it off, <laughs> read that excerpt, and then come on back. So hello, I hope that you checked it out. Um, I'm kind of giving you the benefit of the doubt that you went, you read Aquinas, and now you're interested in this argument that he has, which is really kind of wild, right? Um, what is it that Thomas Aquinas addresses? Okay, so let us look for a second, you know, at his argument, okay? Um, I think you guys can still see this. I'm hoping that the video is showing this, but um, you're probably looking at the same argument that I am. Aquinas is arguing um, that, you know, if this is true, then this is true, then this is true, then this is true, okay? And he kind of says, um, our senses prove that some things are in motion, okay? This is very Aristotle, who is somebody who feels that we know what we know because we can see it, we can touch it, we can smell it. You kind of have to have it in front of you in order to know it, okay? Plato is very much the opposite. You know, Plato's idea of perfect forms, you know, exists someplace in a space outside of what we can see, right? There's a kind of uh, another sphere where perfect forms are. To Aristotle, if we know um, that a chair is made of wood and a chair has certain characteristics, um, we know that a chair is a chair, right? Just like I might know a circle is a circle, okay? So um, I can see it. I know what a circle looks like. It has certain characteristics. Our senses can show it to us. So um, the thing about Aquinas is he kind of suggests here, our senses prove that some things are in motion, okay? So I can see things flying around. Things move when potential motion becomes actual motion. So, you know, if I'm pulling back a rubber band and letting it go, I know what potential motion and actual motion is all about. Only actual motion can convert potential motion into an actual motion. Something has to move that rubber band. Nothing can be at once in both actuality and potentiality in the same respect, okay? So it can't be both things. It can't be potential and actual. Therefore, nothing can move itself, okay? So if that rubber band is gonna be flying, it has to have something to spring it. Therefore, each thing in motion is moved by something else. The sequence in motion cannot go on, um, you know, forever and ever and ever and ever. You know, here he's really talking about, you know, infinite egress, you know, ingress. We, we have to have something that starts uh, motion. It's kind of an assumption that Aquinas makes. Um, therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, put in motion by no other, and this one everyone understands to be God, okay? So um, in the first discussion question, just write down some of the things that you're thinking about, about Aquinas' argument and why this might be important in the 1200s, how this maybe uh, changes the educational process from scribing things in a... Um, 
you know, monastery and, you know, where this might take um, education.